So, as I said, my experience has taken me to multiple countries who are interested in developing the PA role. And as you can see in this slide, um, countries like Germany, the Netherlands, Switzerland, um, the United Kingdom, you know, they've all adopted the model and they have a significant number of PAs working in those countries. And there are a number of programs that have been established in those countries. But up to this point in Ireland, RCSI is the only program that trains physician associates. So we're pretty proud of that. And um, we're also proud of the fact that the Irish Society of PAs are in a phase of growth that promises to be um, really a stabilizing force for all the PAs that are trained here in Ireland because they're the ones that are advocating um, very, very strongly for the inclusion, the full inclusion of PAs in the workforce here in Ireland. So next slide. So many of you may not know what the true definition is of a physician associate, but it is a healthcare professional who's trained at the graduate level. So this is someone who's qualified by having an undergree, undergraduate level eight science degree, uh, and they're qualified to provide medical services to patients within a defined scope of practice. And this is generally under the supervision of a consultant physician. Um, and we will have some testimony uh, later on by a graduate of ours who's currently working, and he can tell you a little bit about what the day-to-day -day responsibilities. Okay, but this is, really, this is really just the textbook definition. And sometimes it's very hard when people are only accustomed to knowing what a health service or a health workforce looks like they know what a doctor is, they know what a consultant is, they know what a GP is, they know what a nurse is, they know what an A&P is, advanced nurse practitioner, and they're not quite sure what space is occupied by the physician associate. And in Ireland, what you'll see is that the PAs become sort of the glue that holds the medical team or surgical team together. Um, they don't rotate off the service. They work alongside junior doctors, registrars, HSOs, consultants, and they add to the depth of talent that is on that multidisciplinary team whose primary focus is really the patient. And so I think that the PA is a stabilizing influence because they don't rotate off every six months. They're the, they're the constant. So we have done research and have shown that the continuity of care piece, and that means the patient is at the center of care, there's a lot of people moving in and out, but the PA is always there. Next slide. So a little bit about the history. It has, as I said, had a high degree of global acceptance. Um, it was initially started, the modern version, I would say the modern version of the physician associate probably started in the late, early to late 60s after the Vietnam War. And this was um, done at Duke University Medical Center in North Carolina. But it built upon very long storied histories of a, an associate medical provider in say Russia or China or Africa because these were individuals that were trained by doctors to provide assistance in the general care of patients because we all know now that you really don't need highly trained doctors sometimes taking care of patients who have relatively minor or chronic illnesses. And so we'll talk a little bit about the scope of practice, but this accelerated training where you come in and within 24 months, you're trained up to the level of a physician associate is what we would call an accelerated degree program that not doesn't end at the end of the 24 months. You continue to learn on site wherever position you, you take up, but it provides the raw fundamental knowledge and skills to succeed in a fast paced environment like clinical medicine. Next slide. 
So in RCSI um, has a long history. Uh, some of you may or may not know the history, but it is an, an, a Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland established in 1784. And we take great pride in the rankings that have been achieved by the university. It is quite the modern international university that trains future healthcare providers. Um, we have four campuses across the globe. Um, there are seven hospitals in the RCSI group where we train our PA students alongside our medical students, physiotherapy students, pharmacy students, and the like. Um, right now, the current number of students at RCSI in Dublin is almost 4,500. Next slide. There we go. So this is a new slide relatively, um, I think it's what you'd call hot off the press because it is um, reflecting the current enrollment. As you said, almost 4,500 registered students here, but it has, I think RCSI has worked really hard, especially over the pandemic, to really emphasize good health and well-being for not only students, but faculty, staff, everyone that's employed at the university um, has almost 38,000 million, 38 million euros in grant funding. Um, we are very research oriented here and you'll see that there are lots of um, evidence-based uh, studies about the physician associate role that have come out of the RCSI program and citations are sort of a metric that is used to say how many times have articles that have been authored by RCSI faculty, how many times have they been cited by other authors? So it demonstrates the depth of research and knowledge that a university has. So we'll go to the next slide and talk a little bit about our program. So we have 50 graduates. Now, that does not sound like a lot, does it? But they are making a huge impact in the, the delivery of care. And I do believe that by 2024, we're hoping to double that number. And that's really only two short years away. And I'll tell you later on how we're going to, how we plan to do that. But the, um, the, we have 28 students that are currently in training. Some of them are here today. Um, and the program is um, populated by myself, Dr. Pauline Joyce, who's on, in the audience. She's our Director of Quality and Clinical Engagement. Dr. Sean Robinson, who's our Director of Education, and he is currently online. And Laura Kenna is here in the audience, and she's our Program Coordinator. So we're a small but mighty bunch. We work very, very hard uh, to not only advocate for our students to deliver top quality education, but also to advocate for the profession. So just some of the details about the program. It has a level nine um, rate uh, grade for uh, graduate education. Um, the course is uh, helps students to understand not only the theory, but the clinical aspect of medicine. We have, I think, extraordinary faculty that not only is not only limited just to the PA faculty, but also to our PA graduates who come in and do guest lectures. We have uh, clinical faculty from the medical school who also teach our students from the anatomy department here at RCSI, pharmacology. So we're really blessed with some extraordinary people. Um, the curriculum is very contemporary. We really try to promote a patient-centered approach to the delivery of clinical care. Um, and I think the small class size, as much as we'd like to grow it, I think you'll find that it does provide sort of an incubator for collegiality, strong friendships, professional role development. And I think that this is critical, especially when you have a new profession in a country that doesn't really know what physician associates are. It's really vital that our students are graduates who feel confident that they can educate and advocate for the profession uh, amongst their peers and their patients. 
Um, it is a very demanding program. There's no doubt about it. It's hard to give up work and come to school full time. It's harder even for our mature students who have to give up a career, if you will. Sometimes they even change careers to come into the program. So it is very demanding. And I think that the intensity of it really prepares you for working in a high stress environment. You know, medicine is high, high stress. Um, it's not easy to take care of patients. It requires stamina. It requires dedication. And it requires an intellectual curiosity, which we really try to inculcate um, to our students here because it doesn't end with this program. The learning continues after you finish and after you get your degree. We have wonderful clinical placements. Uh, some of them take, many of them take place at Beaumont Hospital, which is a, just a tremendous teaching hospital that has dedicated consultants who really are dedicated to education. And the patients there are very challenging. Some of the cases that you see at Beaumont, you won't see anywhere else. And it really does add to the depth of your learning as a physician associate. But the placements take, care, um, take place all throughout the Dublin area and even beyond. So Pauline will talk a little bit about that in the next, um, next few slides. And one of the things we do is also um, try to help our students develop the skills where they can advocate for the profession. Because right now, we're not regulated by the government. So the Department of Health is in the process of recognizing this profession and putting into place the steps or the mechanics, if you will, to give us full regulatory um, authority. So I think the next slide is, I just got to keep track of when Sean comes in. Okay, so this tells you a little bit about our growth. So very, very short length of time we've been educating PAs here, but we have to start somewhere, right? So we have had seven cohorts enrolled to date and the growth continues. Um, in 2022, we had our largest intake of students and I think that represents an enthusiasm an acknowledgement and recognition that this is a profession that is on the move, so to speak. And um, I think one of our uh, guest speakers here today will speak to you about the demand. But I can tell you right now, we get calls every week uh, from hospitals across the country who are very, very interested in hiring PAs. So we hope that our 2023 intake in January is the largest yet. Next slide. So the typical roles of a PA um, will be working in hospitals or in GP settings. So the hospitals might be uh, positions where you'd be working in medicine, you'd be working in surgery, and the types of surgical subspecialties are listed on this slide, but this is just a smattering. This is not all inclusive. Um, so we have orthopedics, breast, colorectal, bariatric surgery, um, we have medical subspecialties such as cardiology, respiratory, and general medicine. Um, surgical and medical assessment units have adopted the PA model, and we know that general practice is experiencing a huge workforce challenge. We don't have many PAs that work in GP settings, but we anticipate that that is a growth area, and we're very excited to be working with general practitioners who really are seeking out higher PAs. Because as we all know, that is an aging workforce and there are not enough in the pipeline to replace those who are leaving. Next. I'm going to leave, I'm going to turn this presentation over to Dr. Sean Robinson, who is our Director of Education and he is online. So I will give the microphone privileges to him. Okay, thank you, Lisa. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me. If not, just let me know in the chat function if I need to change my microphone. 
Uh, so as Lisa mentioned, my name is Sean Robinson. I'm the director of education, which essentially means I'm the academic director. I help to organize the first eight months of classroom based learning that happens in the PA program. And on the slide before you are the modules that comprise the PA program, and I'll just go through those um, individually briefly. So foundations of clinical medicine, when you think of medicine, this is the course that you're thinking of. So all of the body systems and things that happen there normally, but also what happens in the process of disease. Uh, that is discussed and assessed in the Foundations of Clinical Medicine course, which kind of goes throughout the entire seven to eight months of that first year. Uh, so th these modules all overlap. They do not start and end before the next one begins. So just keep that in mind. It's a little bit different than what you may have experienced in other education settings. The next one listed, number two, is Clinical Medicine and Practice, and this is the history taking, the physical exam as they pertain to what it is you're learning in the foundations of clinical medicine course. So in other words, when you're studying the cardiovascular system and the diseases that happen there, you'll also be learning about how to properly assess a patient's history of cardiovascular disease and the risk factors for CVD, as well as completing a physical exam for the cardiovascular system. Um, we also have some uh, small case-based or group-based Mod, uh, sub modules, if you will, of the CMP module where you get an opportunity to discuss cases of how a patient may present the questions you may want to ask of them, what sort of physical exam you would do, and then moving on through the process of diagnosis and building a management plan. And at the tail end of the CMP module, right before you go off into your clinical placements, there is a week long intensive clinical skills training uh, session, if you will, where you're going to be taught and you'll get to practice several different clinical skills all before going right out into the clinical placements where you get to use those skills hopefully on a very frequent basis. The next one is pharmacology and therapeutics. These are the drugs that you um, hopefully one day will be prescribing as a PA in Ireland. At the moment that's not the case but it is the goal that you will eventually get there and so we're teaching our students to be able to prescribe the medications that would be needed to treat the diseases that we're discussing in foundations of clinical medicine. So the pharmacology and therapeutics course does just that. It instructs you on those drugs, how they work, um, and to some extent how you would actually use them in daily practice. Um, personal and professional development is related to uh, what is the PA? What, what does the PA look like in Ireland versus elsewhere in the world? How, how are you going to uh, sort of adapt your way of um, previous experience and thinking into the development of the profession itself. So the identity of the PA profession is a big part of that. There's also things like uh, working within a team, leadership skills, how to hone in on your communication skills uh, for not only just good clinical care, but also just moving the profession forward in Ireland. And finally, evidence-based practice in healthcare. Uh, much like the title implies, this is where you're taking the evidence that is in the medical or scientific literature, analyzing it, and then using it in clinical scenarios. Uh, this is getting you in the habit of this very important process in terms of clinical practice. How do you use the research that already exists and um, use it to your benefit in practice? But it also builds on what will ultimately become your culminating uh, research endeavor in your training. The quality improvement project, which I think Dr. Joyce will probably mention to you, um, essentially becomes your dissertation for your um, degree. And uh, it, it really does rely on knowing all of the skills related to analyzing and critiquing the literature. So beyond the um, Beyond the actual uh, coursework that I just mentioned before, there's some other things going on in the background. I'm just going to remind folks that are online, if you wouldn't mind, please make sure you mute your microphone so that we aren't uh, getting some feedback there. Uh, so the program, as mentioned before, very much focused on patient care, and that's definitely the case in, in and out of the classroom. We have a pretty short time in the classroom with the goal of getting you into clinical placement very early in your training. Um, just because that is going to probably make the biggest impact on your overall uh, skills development and how you take care of patients. So it is very patient focused. Uh, we do have some basic science like anatomy and physiology that are part of the curriculum, but uh, where we can, we try to always bring it back to, well, how will this work in the form of patient care in the clinical setting? 
We have a lot of PA mentoring from the year two students and graduates. So we have a tight connection with a lot of the alumni. As Lisa had mentioned, there aren't that many of them. So it's actually giving us a really good opportunity to stay in constant contact with them. Uh, and it's been excellent in terms of them providing guidance to students who are still in training right before they're either entering clinical placements. That particularly is the case with the second year students who are connected with our first year students. But also as they finish their clinical training and they move on to their first job as a PA, I think it's really helpful to have the alumni present to sort of guide that process. Uh, we have both blended and peer-to-peer -peer learning. The blended component uh, will probably be touched on later in the Q&A. Uh, we do rely pretty heavily on online formats, uh, pre-recorded sessions, um, and things like what we're in right now. That was a result of um, COVID, and it sort of let us know that there are some very helpful ways to deliver content that we don't always have to be in the classroom. Um, so technology mediated education simulation uh, is a fancy way of saying uh, we will oh, excuse me that's two different things uh, the i'm going to skip the technology mediated education i kind of already addressed that the simulation um, really is re referring to york street and the uh, simulation simulated clinical environment that exists there where you can actually practice as if you are seeing a real patient when in fact you're not. In some cases, it may be an actor playing the role of a patient. In other cases, it may be a mannequin that's doing that. Or in some others, it may just be a peer, one of your students who is taking on the role of a patient and giving you the opportunity to practice what that will be like before you actually have to do the real thing in your clinical placements. Your placements are in various healthcare environments, meaning outpatient, inpatient, uh, some critical care, uh, that is to kind of give you a rounded experience so that you're prepared for any environment as you graduate. In terms of career preparation, this uh, is guided primarily by faculty with or in staff within the program, but also there's a lot of feedback from the clinical preceptors who will be working with you in the second year, the alumni who have maybe encountered some obstacles in various uh, roles that they've had as a new graduate. And so all of that will kind of feed into you being better prepared as you start your first job as a PA. Um, we do put an emphasis on the multidisciplinary team. There are several instances of this in both the didactic and clinical phase where you are not acting alone, that you have to work in combination with the expertise and skills of other healthcare team members. So it really is emphasized throughout the curriculum that you have to be able to do this um, and and sort of take advantage of the fact that others have different areas of expertise that will help you in your your job. Um, and then exposure in the variety of scope of roles as a PA uh, and this primarily will come into play during the clinical phase when you get to see PAs doing what they do uh, but also as various clinical preceptors will put you into different environments where you're either seeing a patient in the outpatient setting by yourself, performing physical exam and reporting back, um, or whether you're first assisting in surgery. Uh, the goal is that you get multiple exposures in different environments so that you're well prepared for your first. Um, um, so with that, I'm going to actually hand it over to Dr. Joyce to go into the uh, clinical rotation sites. Yeah, I'm unmuted. So with our clinical rotation sites, we um, have a lot of different sites that we place our students in and we get requests, I suppose, quite regularly uh, for physician associates uh, as graduates. So we then recommend that uh, our students go on rotation there. So, uh, I mean, we have listed some of them there. Uh, the RCSI has a group of seven hospitals and we send our students primarily to Beaumont Hospital. There's a bit of feedback, sorry about that. Um, so the RTSI hospital group is our first port of call and then the hospitals within the Ireland East group and uh, Dublin's Midlands. You can see we're, we've been involved with all the groups now and Lisa will talk more about the um, hybrid model after myself. So we'd be talking about hospitals right around the country. In the GP settings as well, we, we have GPs right around the country at the moment, mostly in Dublin. And then, as Sean said, that the um, students are placed on uh, special rotations. So the Rotunda Hospital, there's a bit of competition here, I think. The Rotunda Hospital for uh, Women's Health, Paediatrics at Temple Street and Crumlin Hospitals. 
and mental health at Highfield or Beaumont Hospital. And then in the private sector, there's quite a demand for physician associates as well. So we've placed students in the Blackrock Health Group, on Secure Hospital Group, the Matter Private in Cork, St Vincent's Private Hospital. And you'll hear from one of our graduates who works there at the moment and in Centric Health Primary Care. Next slide, please, Sean. And then with our assessments and our resources, we have uh, quite an array of assessments, and that's really to uh, meet the needs of every student, really, and, and all students have different learning requirements and preferences. So we have quite a lot of MCQ exams online, and students do them in the classroom, but we use the online format. We have short answer quizzes, clinical exams, where you take the history of the patient, examine the patient, etc. Um, you have written assignments like essay type, presentations like this, you, you uh, present back to your peers, mm -hmm. case studies of patients where you present them and are asked some questions on them. And we have a clinical skills passport which lists all the clinical skills and um, other uh, medical skills that you will be taught uh, during the programme as well and you get signed off on them. Then when you're on placement, uh, similar to what the medical students do, you present to a consultant, you present a, a clinical case to a consultant, you give the history, what you found a physical exam, what the, your uh, differential diagnosis is and your management plan. So this happens when you're on placement every three weeks and you uh, must get signed off on that. And then as, as Sean mentioned as well, the quality improvement dissertation is um, a plan that you work on with colleagues at Beaumont Hospital for the most part, um, but also with uh, other colleagues in other hospitals as well, where you come up with um, a plan to make the patient experience better. So we all know now we have very long waiting lists for patients accessing our system. So our focus on our projects will be on trying to um, shorten those waiting times for, for patients getting into the system. Our resources, Sean has mentioned some of these already, are our physician associate graduates and uh, we we'll hear from a graduate, uh, or two of our graduates today, one of our graduates today and a second year student soon to be graduate as well. Cloudy, I nearly had you graduated already. Um, we have an online library, uh, online resources that we use as well, including videos. We have an online platform, some of you might be familiar with already Moodle or I think the Called the Loop in DCU. Um, we have a simulation centre, which you've, you've seen on York Street on your way in here. Um, and we use that quite a lot with uh, our practice of our physical exams, history taking, and assessments. And then you also have access to medical and uh, the medical school and other schools in RCSI as well. Next slide, Sean, please. Maybe wait for me to mention the exam, which I didn't mention, so I'll mention it now. We have an Irish Society of Physician Associates that was set up with our first few groups of graduates. And this is where all our graduate physician associates register. Uh, so as Lisa said, we're, we're waiting for regulation by the government. And in the interim, we have a register of all graduate physician associates who are working in the Irish system. And that's important because that uh, ensures that all our, our the graduates um, have passed the master's programme and also have done a national exam. <coughs> so the physician associate it does a national exam every six years to maintain the, their generic knowledge um, and skills that they've learned on the programme and to be able to demonstrate that to employers is quite important. So you'll see there as well that we have a social media site and some of you might be here today because of social media. Uh, we have a Twitter account, PA, RCSI underscore PA studies, and you'll see that that's been active quite a lot recently because we had a uh, recent graduation, which you can see there on the, the bottom left hand corner. And you might recognize Aaron when he when he comes up to talk in a minute is there in the photograph. So quite a lot going on and um, quite a demand really for for the PA uh, in, the, in the workforce at the moment. I'll hand back to Lisa. Thanks. <coughs> So this part of the presentation is going to describe for you uh, the pilot program that we plan to launch in January of 2023. 
So you might think it's a strange time to start a graduate program because most educational programs commence in September. However, the PA program here at RCSI commences in January um, for some very specific reasons that may or may not be germane to this presentation, except to say that we need the resources of the anatomy department. And sometimes it's easier to gain access to the faculty and into the um, lab, um, anatomy lab when we have uh, January, February, March, because that's a low use period for the medical school. And so we don't have as many PAs or we don't have as many students um, going through the lab. So that's why the PA program starts in January. So it's an atypical start for a course. In January of 2023, we're going to test the model even further. And we're going to say that we're going to pilot a remote hybrid program for students that live outside of Dublin County. And the reason we're doing this is because, well, there, I think there are two main drivers. One of which is there are so many hospitals outside of Dublin that would like to, they would like to hire PAs. However, we have very few PAs that are recruited from those counties like down in Cork or Waterford or Limerick or Letterkenny. Um, we don't have a large group of students that are coming into the program that come from those areas. Secondly, we don't have a lot of students that graduate who would like to move to those areas because they're not local, they weren't, weren't raised there, they don't have family there, and for, for, for a variety of reasons, they would like to stay in the Dublin area. So we thought that we could start, again, these are the lessons that we learned during COVID was that we can deliver um, high quality education uh, using the technology that has been somewhat uh, upgraded during the COVID uh, pandemic. So our aim in this particular pilot is to expand the professional footprint of PAs across the country. And no better way than to develop a workforce that's local and doesn't have to relocate to Dublin for the entire two years of the program. The only way we could really make this work was to establish relationships with hospitals all across the country. Because as you know, or may or may not know, hospitals are, for, they are, uh, how should I say it? They, they are grouped basically by location across the country and they have academic partnerships so there might have an academic partnership down in Cork, the South Southwest Hospital Group might have an affiliation with UCC. However, there's no PA program down in Cork. There's no PA program down in Waterford. There's nothing in Galway. There's nothing in Limerick. So what we're hoping to do is, and we've been successful in going to these hospital groups and saying, if you want to have PAs, then train them locally. And we can be a partner with you as we deliver the didactic education online. They will be equivalent to the students that are sitting in the classroom here on St. Stephen's Green. We will live stream the lectures. The students will be required to come to Dublin twice a month because we want them to have the full advantage of the resources that are here on campus, such as the anatomy lab, the simulation lab, and just being able to connect with their on-campus colleagues. So during the didactic section of the program, students will be coming up to campus twice a month if they are part of this remote hybrid. Then when it comes time to their clinical rotations, in clinical placements, they will be done where they live, whether it's Galway, Limerick, Waterford, Cork, wherever. And by doing this, we will really expand the footprint of PAs outside of Dublin County. And if our, if our intake is what we think it's going to be, 
we can expand the number of PAs outside of Dublin County by 250% in two short years. And that's some of the beauty of this, of this educational model. We can, we can provide an accelerated degree program that gets people out into the workforce, very highly skilled people out into the workforce in a very short period of time. So we think this approach to local workforce development is very appealing to hospital administrators who are really struggling to recruit well-qualified staff, especially with the pent-up demand that we've seen after COVID. Next slide. Maybe Sean's taking a nap. <laughs> you can. Oh, I see. Taking a long time. There you go. Okay, so as, as I mentioned, we're looking to really um, expand this profession outside of our, our local uh, geographic vicinity. So, um, if people are interested and they meet the qualifications, there is an expression of interest form on our PA website. That's the program website at RCSI. Um, you have to complete an application to the program, and there is a tick box that says, I'd like to uh, apply for the, on the remote hybrid. And as I said, twice a month on campus, and uh, we will have all of our sessions live streamed. So this is not the type of program where you would be working full time during the day and going home and taking these classes at night by yourself in your bedroom. That's just not the nature of what we think is a, uh, the type of educational model that we wanna promote because we want the students that are in this remote program to feel fully engaged in the education so that they'll be able to ask questions of an anatomy or a pharmacology professor or a, a clinical medicine expert in respiratory. They would have the full advantages as if they were in the classroom. And then the clinical placements would be arranged at hospitals close to where they live. And the expectations are that you have sufficient technology, support, broadband internet that can support this type of online learning. Good thing is that we give every student a laptop so that all of the platforms are standardized. You'll take all your exams at home. You won't have to come to campus for your MCQs. They will have remote proctoring capability. So everything will be a level playing field, just as if you were on campus. Next slide. So what we're gonna do now is hear from some of our guest speakers. And I'm going to um, first introduce Sinead Reagan, who is our first year PA student. Second year PA student is Claudie Kalemi, and our PA graduate is Aaron Donnelly. And I thought it might be nice for the people that are online to actually see the speakers um, because they don't really have slides to go through. So Laura's gonna switch the camera view and everyone can see they can feel like they're in the room. Oh. Let's make sure you're front okay. and center. Okay, that looks great. So good afternoon, everybody. It's lovely to meet you all. Um, it's nice to see such a great interest in our profession. Um, so just to give you a little bit of information about myself and how I ended up in the program. Um, so I am one of the traditional students that are, or non-traditional students that uh, Lisa referred to. So I did my undergrad in biomedical science as a mature student. Um, thought that I would probably go into research, um, but spent a summer on a research program and decided it wasn't for me. Um, I had the opportunity to do some study in America for a semester. And while over there, I could hear everyone talking about how they were applying for PA school. And I had never heard of it before. And I was like, oh, what's PA school? They're here to a uh, four year science degree and they're all going off to be trained as personal assistants. No idea what the role was. Um, 
I uh, then one of the girls told me about it and I was like this sounds exactly what I would like to do but had never heard about it in Ireland and kind of put it back to the back of my head um, my mom actually about six months later had to go into hospital for a small procedure and while I was there the physician uh, a physician associate came to see her um, before her operation so I got very excited uh, ignored my mom for a few minutes and wanted to find out where she trained. So she subsequently told me that she trained here in RCSI. So I was on the internet straight away. So that's how I found out about the program. Um, I suppose my background, I come from biomedical science background. So I would have done physiology, biochemistry and anatomy. Um, in terms of the course, it's incredibly demanding. Um, I'll be perfectly honest with you. Um, we're coming towards the end of our didactic year, um, we're all tired, um, but saying that the course is incredibly rewarding. Um, you always remember that it's patient-centred, um, you get the opportunity to, we had a day where we shadowed in Beaumont with our um, second-year mentors. Um, we're lucky in the fact that one of the requirements for the course is that you have to have a science degree. Um, so you're coming in with a background knowledge already. So I will say, I don't think any of our classmates would say that they found the content difficult per se. If someone mentioned an action potential, they knew what it was. Um, it, it's just the volume that gets thrown at you in the and in such a short time period. So as Sean mentioned, how the course is structured is it usually goes by body systems. So when we started off, we may have done dermatology or MSK, and then your anatomy and your pharmacy programs followed also. So you would have done MSK in your anatomy and pharmacology. And then you usually have exams every Monday or every second Monday. So as soon as your exam is finished on Monday morning, then your next system starts straight away. So there's no, um, I suppose gap really to it's hard to find time to relax but I think I'm very positive about that program I hope that's coming across <laughs> um I will say it's a small class um a very small class and your classmates will be your greatest resource so there's some of my classmates sitting up there and we have a pharmacist a geneticist um, mental health nurse, pediatric nurse, someone who's done a physics degree, health promotion, dietetics. Um, so we all help each other. You know, um, it's not competitive. We're all there to bring each other along. Um, and in terms of the staff, they're amazing. Um, there's four staff members. And I would say we're the best looked after master's program in Ireland, you know. They're always there at your back call. You get feedback on any exams you do. Um, we had our first OSCE exam yesterday. So I don't know if any of you know what that means. So it's an objective structured clinical exam. So we finished that yesterday. We had our results yesterday evening. We had our feedback sessions this morning. So you get looked after incredibly well. Um, so we're coming to the end of our didactic program. So we have, we'll have our final exams in July, we get a three week break and then we come back to do our week of clinical skills. And following that, that then we're about to head off on our placements in August. So it was lovely to be able to speak to you all. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions anyone has, if they even want to contact Laura in the programme and if she wants to give her emails, we'll happily answer any questions. So, thank you. Thank you. Hi guys, my name is Clyde. I'm one of the second year Physician Associate students. Um, so I don't have any slides, but I wrote some small notes on a piece of paper that I'd like to mention. Uh, so I'll start off and talk a little bit about um, um, how first year went for me and then how second year is going. Um, and then I'll also mention a little bit about uh, how it's like, how it was like for me applying for the course and then um, and all those sorts. So what I did for before I started the course. Um, so my background is in physiology. 
and I graduated in 2020. I'll stand in the middle. <laughs> uh, I graduated in 2020, and then I really did not want to go. Physiology is a very lab-based, science-y uh, subject. I really did not want to work in a lab by myself. I liked having uh, contact with other people and talking to other people. Um, and then I found out about the course online. Um, I was just trying to get away from lab as much as possible, and I came across the PA course online um, and read about it, uh, watched some videos about it, and uh, it really sparked my interest. And so I applied for it. And luckily enough, I was able to get in for the 2021 year. Um, if you have a healthcare background, that's great. That's really good. It's really helpful. Physiology was really helpful for me. It helps you understand some of the uh, clinical medicine, medicine part. If you have a pharmacy background, it helps you understand the pharmacy, the pharmacology modules. But if you don't, don't be scared. If you have, let's say, um, a sports physiology background or a psychology background, don't be scared. It's, it might require a little bit more work, but uh, like uh, Sinead was saying, your class is there to help you. You'll have, um, it, it's a small class. So you can all get very close together very quickly and everyone's there to help each other out. Um, so I'll talk about my first year experience. Um, so uh, I'll mention just a little bit about the hybrid program. So I started in 2021, which was the second peak of COVID. So if anything, I have a little bit of an experience about what uh, the hybrid program might be like. Um, a lot of our stuff was done online and it's definitely something that would I would consider beneficial, especially for uh, people who are coming from outside of Dublin to not have to make a, a journey in every day for lectures. Um, stuff that can be done online can be done online and it works it works the same as it does as in person and then of course you'll come in for the physical uh, uh, exams and for the uh, clinical skills and so on so it's definitely a welcome change and I, I don't think to don't be scared away from it because it's hybrid and it's uh, it's all going to be online it's definitely something that works um, and when starting the program um, I was very very excited but at the same time, also very nervous. Um, you know, I, I took into account that this is going to be um, a very busy next two years. It's uh, very intense and it's something that, it, like, you might be used to, if you're coming in straight from uh, an undergraduate degree, you might be used to having a four to five month uh, summer break. But you don't get that here. Uh, you kind of work through the summer break. You'll get a, very, you'll get a short three week break uh, after your exams. Um, but it's definitely something to be prepared for um, and it's something you have to be prepared for to be working straight to be studying from January through to December uh, having lectures having exams um, and for those who are coming from a working uh, background so for somebody who's finished college a while ago and is working now uh, it's definitely a good idea to be prepared to leave your job for the next two years and be prepared to you know, um, survive not having to go back to work because it can be very intense, especially once you get to placement. Um, you're going to be doing 40 hours a week in the hospital, along with coming home and studying. And then if if you're strong enough to keep a job on top of that, fair play. Um, but it's definitely something that you should prepare for uh, because it's very intense. You could like one week you could be doing, you could be nearly finished cardiology and then in the next week or two, you have a cardiology exam, you have a pharmacology exam, and then you're halfway through MSK. And then there's an exam the next week. So it's definitely something that keeps you on your toes. And it's very important to not fall behind and to keep on top of your work and to make sure you're not falling behind. And again, you'll have your classmates. Everyone, there's so little competition. Everyone is here to help each other out. And everyone is trying to help everyone graduate. The more PAs out, uh, that are out there, the better. Um, <laughs> So it's definitely a good way to keep on top of things is forming study groups and working with each other. Um, and this helps you grow closer as friends. It's a very small class. Uh, our class was, is quite small. So it's very easy to become friendly with everyone. And these are the people that you're gonna be, your, your classmates, your friends, and then eventually your uh, work colleagues. So it's definitely a good thing to grow close with them and then help each other out, help each other get through the hardest bits. Uh, so my second year, experience so once the didactic part of the year is over um i kind of see second year starting right after that because from there on from about august and onwards it's just placement straight through all the way till you finish so it's about a year and a third of a year of placement and it's 
the, like I said, it's the 40 hours a week. Um, and then once you're finished in the hospital, you're probably going to be studying at home. So it doesn't end once you go home. And you'll spend three weeks on each rotation. So you'll do three weeks in cardiology and then three weeks in head and neck surgery, three weeks in colorectal surgery. And um, it's this is probably one like where you'll make you'll have most of your memorable experiences. Um, and placement is definitely one of the most exciting parts of the course as well. This is where you get to put what you learned in books and lectures, you get to put it into action, you get to see patients, you get to do, you get to take bloods, you get to uh, put an NG tube in, you get to literally put in what you learned, you get to put it to action. Um, you get to do a lot of your clinical skills on placement, uh, especially when the team is very, um, when the team benefits from a student, that's where, that's like one of the best like working and learning experiences you can get. Um, the team will get you to see your own patient, will get you to take bloods from that patient, and then you report back to the team, this is what I talked to the patient, this is what they said, this is what their condition is, um, this is what I think the diagnosis is. This is what I'd manage it like. And then they'll help you along. If you did a great job, they'll say, great. If uh, they think you should add something else, they say, oh, well, do this. And then it's really, it's a great work experience to see how the patient comes in all the way through to when they finish. And then sometimes you can even scrub into theater and scrub in for a procedure and watch the patient that you admitted be, help, be there helping in their uh, surgery. Um, so it's definitely one of the best learning experiences and it's something to really look forward to. It can be, I was a little bit nervous uh, on my first time, just especially for somebody coming from a science background uh, who doesn't have any hospital experience. Um, it might be a little bit easier for somebody coming from like a physio or a nursing background, but again, everyone's going to be nervous on their first day, so it's nothing to worry about. Um, and it's definitely, again, it's really something to look forward to. It's probably the most exciting part of the course. And yeah. Uh, uh, if there's any questions, pop them into the chat and I can answer them or I'll stick around as well for anyone in person that has any questions. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, lads. I actually don't know how to continue on about the RCSI experience, to be honest, because Sinead and Clyde have both uh, uh, hit on it. But uh, my name is Aaron Donnelly. I'm a recent graduate here from the programme and working in St. Vincent's Private Hospital in colorectal and general surgery. Um, I suppose in terms of RCSI, the two guys, as I said, have, have hit the nail in the head, but uh, they've touched on the, the didactic learning as the first years are, are going through at the moment. And, and Clyde has kind of briefly touched on the, the second year and the end of first year experience of going on your clinical rotations. Um, I suppose the, the biggest question that, that we would have had as, as first year and second year students is, will we have a job? And it, it was very unsure. I was only the fifth cohort, so we knew all the graduates were previously working, but how many more people would be working after that? And I don't know if the first years knows this, or even if Clyde knows this, but when you're on placement, it's a job interview. And every consultant that I can testify, uh, both in my workplace and in Beaumont, currently wants one PA, if they can get the funding for a second PA, they'll take it. Um, and from my experience currently in Vincent's, so I work with two colorectal surgeon consultants. Um, I am their team in the private. It's me and my consultants. We don't have a registrar. We don't have an SHO and we don't have an intern. So pri pri primarily my role is uh, seeing the patients pre-op, discussing their operations. This is on a Monday and a Tuesday going through any questions, concerns, anything they have that I can alleviate prior to getting to that theatre and my consultant arriving on the ward. Generally, we have about 10 patients per list, so that's 20 patients a week, and they can be from minor procedures that are day cases, which is quite uh, very few, but generally we go to big cases that are large colectomies, uh, removing of people's colons, um, hernia operations, and things like that. So as I've grown in my role in the last couple of months, I have, have become known to these procedures quite well that I'm able to discuss this operation with the patient and uh, alleviate any fears or concerns that they have into the fact that my consultant just comes on the ward and will consent the patient. Legally, we aren't allowed to consent patients, which in my opinion is a valuable asset of having the consultant because at the end of the day, um, we can tell them all about it, but it's the consultant that's solely responsible for us. And I think that's the beneficial part about being part of the team and being a PA. Um, 
you have to know your your limitations certainly as a PA and, and that certainly is one of them. Um, so then we'll go to theatre on a Monday and a Tuesday which is quite a big list because we last 10 hours in theatre between different surgeries um, and I'll first assist in all of those operations. Uh, generally we do have registrars, we are linked with the University Hospital in, in Vincent's and we do have registrars and fellows part of that team and if we do have big cases and especially for them they are in their training they're near consultancy level you kind of want to give them the first assist reign they're the ones that are going to be doing these operations soon enough um, so i will then second assist in the big operations but if the fellows are, or the registrars are busy as it was this week because it's been hectic in the hospital i'll first assist in those operations and then we'll do post-op reviews the day after. Generally, I see the patients by myself, if not one of my consultants will join me, and we'll round. And then back to theatre again on a Tuesday. That's my, my Monday and a Tuesday, my long days, 13, 14 hour days. And that's very subjective as to what team that you're in. Um, general medicine is generally eight hours, but theatre, you can't leave, unfortunately. Um, so then Wednesday, Thursday, Friday is, is my general post-op reviewing and uh, seeing new inpatients that have been admitted via the university into the private. Um, and I'll be solely responsible for those rounds because um, my consultants are busy, they're in different hospitals. And what I do is I formulate a big plan, give them a big update on, on what's going on. I text them, this is what I think we should do. Have you any more ideas of what we should do? And I get the wheels in motion. Um, they're not used to having a team in the private hospital. So having a PA with them currently is, has been a huge benefit because they work in the different parts of the hospital groups in the University, St. Michael's and um, Lachlanstown. So they're not always on site, but now that I'm there, I'm constantly on site. The nurses will call me, I'll come review the patient and then I will contact my consultant with an update. So it kind of creates a bridged gap with someone with the medical training that we are accustomed to over the last two years that you can give this update and the consultant gives you advice. Um, I suppose in terms of uh, in, in terms of our limitations at the moment, which the guys have touched on, is the, is the regulation and and that of being um, able to prescribe either medications or ionising radiation. But the, I can account for the work that both Lisa, Pauline, and Sean online and Laura are putting into it, and also the the ISPA board members. Um, the work that's been done in the background is is a lot and I don't think people realize that until you get out into the workforce and you see and you become friends and colleagues with these people um, but speaking from about the, the job opportunities in Vincent's alone I've been stopped in the last week by I've had a biliary plastic surgery orthopedics and that's just surgery because that's my role um, I imagine and I can probably testify that there's a lot of uh, medical specialties because I know surgery isn't everyone's passion it is mine um, but I have plenty of colleagues that are currently working in general medicine and GP around the country, um, which is great um, because that was certainly one of the questions that I had coming into the programme as only the fifth cohort is, will I have a job? And I just got an email literally in the last 10 minutes, there's another job after popping up. That's just been advertised. So um, they're popping up every, every week. There's two jobs, three jobs, which is great. Um, and it'll only get bigger. And I, I suppose I can testify to the hybrid model. When I started in RCSI, I was in the program, I'd say, well, Pauline, were we in the program eight weeks and COVID happened and it was a mad rush. No one could get out, be in the, in the college, no one could be in the hospitals and everything went online. And it's a testimony to what the guys have done here that everything went online and I met to stand here as a graduate. So <laughs> we, it obviously went fine. Um, <laughs> But I, I think it'll be a great benefit to the program and uh, certainly the anatomy coming up here on campus for that will be a huge benefit. Unfortunately, we didn't get that opportunity because of COVID. We couldn't be in, in, the, in the college. Um, but I, I don't think the being online, you'll be any more disadvantaged than what you will be from being on campus as long as you can come up and get the, the work done. But um, as, as Clyde said, the, the working for the two years um, is probably, is I would say it's a no-go. Um, I did do it and I could probably regret it um, severely. Um, I was severely burnt out after two years. Um, it's, it's long, it's hard, but it's definitely worthwhile towards the end of it. Um, it in, in terms of my work and week, that, that's generally what I do. And I, I suppose if there's any questions as to what I do in my, in my job, I'm, I'm happy to answer them. Um, and or if there's any questions about anything throughout the last two years of the programme, I'm, I'm certainly happy to answer them as well.
Thank you to Sinead and Claudia and Aaron. You did a wonderful job, and I'm sure all of the information that you provided to the folks here and also online was extremely helpful. So fair play. Let's go to the next slide. I think we have a short video that we wanted to share with you. So it it speaks to, I guess, let's next it speaks to this um, notion of advocacy. So there are a lot of people who don't know what a PA is. I can tell you that when I was younger and my parents were asking me what I wanted to do when I grow up, so to speak, <laughs> I told them that I wanted to be a PA and they said, what is a PA? And now, well, my father has since passed on, but um, he took so much pride in his late years to be able to tell his friends that his daughter was a PA and that so many people that took care of him uh, in the hospital were PAs. And he just was so excited to be able to say that, you know, my daughter was one of the first to be trained as a PA. And so your parents will be the same, say the same thing about you um, as they age. So this is an, uh, a video that we just put together um, to target policymakers, uh, people who are interested in the profession, uh, people who hire PAs, um, to get them to be a little bit from more familiar with what the role is. So I'm gonna push play and I'm gonna hope that everyone online and in person can hear uh, So this. Lisa, I'll actually have to be the one that pushes play on that. So I'm gonna go ahead and mute. Oh, Sean's gonna do it? Yeah, I'm gonna mute you. I know that people online will be able to hear this. If you can't hear it in the auditorium, just put a message in the chat and I'll go ahead and stop the video. Can you tell Sean we can't hear it? The, the physician associate has that. The physician associate has added great value to our medical team over the past year. The physician associate is trained in the medical model, so thinks and behaves like a, a young physician and also provides a continuity of care. I'm a physician associate in colorectal and general surgery at the moment. Um, as a physician associate, we see patients in clinic, we assist in surgery, we see patients in the ward, and we have a lot of clinical skills and work under a supervising consultant. I accept patients from the emergency department and I do diagnostic and therapeutic procedures on them, um, which gets them a quicker route into a respiratory unit. I'm a physician associate in cardiology. Uh, I work in the angio department primarily. Uh, my time is split between there and the ward. I admit patients, uh, consent them for their procedures. A favourite part of my role is my involvement in theatre, in the operating theatre. Um, we do quite complex surgery with my team um, and I'm, I'm lucky to be trained as the first assistant with our robotic surgery. We have patients now who are returning to see us uh, who recognise the physician associate and are happy to see the physician associate again, understand that they're part of the team and they provide a friendly face and a, a, a continuity piece that I think many of our staff aren't able to do. There's a cancer coming back they feel they don't have to tell the whole story again, that I know them. And so they're very happy with that and their family are happy with that. So I work very closely with the CNSs and they're wonderful and they know the patients well. So it's great that I happen to have that role in that specialty. In my department specifically, the consultant, Reg and NCHDs will all rotate either once a month or once every six weeks. Um, and I stay in the unit. So when the new staff come, I can update them on the patients, their treatment plan, what has been done or what needs to be done. So the continuity of care is there for the patients. There's a big pent up demand post the pandemic and waiting list, particularly in uh, the area that I work in, which is in respiratory care. So our physician associate has helped 
come into the clinic allow us to develop a new clinic that sees patients in a rapid access type format. i look forward to being part of the progression of the physician associate profession in ireland as we seek regulation i hope that it will open more doors for uh, different medical and surgical specialties um, and we'll be able to enhance the healthcare system in ireland. Thank you, Sean. So I think that is the end of our slides and our information that we have prepared. So we'd be happy to open up the program to any questions uh, that you have either here in the theater or online. Laura is going to mon monitor the chat function. So um, please don't be shy. So at the present time, uh, you are limited in that regard, just in Ireland. Just in Ireland. Um, the, you know, the UK PAs right now are seeking to be regulated, and they anticipate that once that happens, there will be a pathway for other PAs from Ireland, for instance, to work in the United Kingdom. But that process has not been identified. As far as going to America, that is probably not going to be uh, anything in the near future. I can't rule it out 100%, but at the current time, the only way a physician associate can work in the United States is to have graduated from a PA program that is accredited by that national board in the United States. So you cannot take that, ex you can't take the official um, American exam, much like we have here in Ireland where we have an Irish exam, you cannot take the American exam unless you graduated from an American program. Now, I could see a path in the future because nurses can do it, doctors can do it, physios can do it, but our profession is young and it is yet to um, have advanced to that place. But I do think that there's a benefit to policymakers right now to be able to say, we are training an Irish workforce. That helps because we are trying to get policymakers to adopt this profession and integrate it into the healthcare system. So at the present time, when we're saying we're training an Irish workforce, I think that pays, will pay dividends long run in getting us regulated. Any other questions? Yeah, hello. Hello, hello. Hello, good afternoon here in Ghana. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah, this is Dr. Richard, um, a lecturer at Accra Tinka University in Ghana. I want to find out, I have a um, um, high school science, biology, physics, chemistry, elective mathematics, and I also have first degree, second degree, and a PhD. But the PhD, first degree, masters, they are all in statistics. It's only my high school that is in pure science. W would I be qualified to enroll as an international student, please? Thank you very much for your question. At the present time, the only people that are eligible for the remote hybrid program are people that live in Ireland or have an EU passport. So I'm afraid we have had some people that filled out an expression of interest form for the hybrid program that were in America, they were in Canada, they were in France. <laughs> and unfortunately we could not consider them for the program. Okay, that's, that's, that's good, thank you very much. But what about if I um, I relocate to Ireland and I have the resident permit or something like that of sort, will I still be qualified based on my background as I've already said? I think for questions like that, if you can email PA studies at rcsi.ie, we'll get back to you individually, if that's okay, all right? Okay. Thank you uh, very much. Clear if people online can text in the question and then we'll repeat it and answer, please.
Yeah. No, don't don't worry about it. I'm sitting in the wrong space. No, no. Um, so obviously at the start, you said it's obviously like a, a newer profession. People are still understanding, you know, what it is and what PAs do. And um, you've also, from what I've heard from the graduates and current students, that they certainly improve the efficiency of the clinical team in terms of like, you know, resources and time for patient care. I'm just wondering uh, in terms of kind of inter-workplace relations and perhaps it's like a vocal minority, but um, I suppose I'm talking about like how are PAs received by, you know, younger physicians, particularly in terms of how, you know, whether there's disputes over working conditions for young doctors and um, kind of, you know, opportunities for um, further learning in the hospital. Um, mm -hmm. Are PAs received well in that sense or is there kind of cause for any kind just of professional tension in that way? Or maybe it's not an issue. So the question just for people online is about the PA role and how they're received by uh, particularly the younger doctor professions because there's a shortage of doctors and there's a lot of issues going on there. And if I understand you properly about the, doc the uh, doctors in training getting enough time for training as well. Okay, so we, do you want me to take some of that? So we got some of that uh, feedback when we set up the pilot project initially. And the questions were, would the physician associates be taking some of the hours of the, of the doctors in training? In fact, no, is the, the short answer, because the doctors in training were doing a lot of indirect patient care. And with the physician associates joining the team, they were able to get, back, get on board with more inpatient, direct inpatient care, um, whereas the physician associate was able to, they weren't, competing for the training slots. So they were able to complement the team and actually improved the position for the NCHDs, as we call them, the doctors in training. Um, from other professions, initially, there was a bit of kickback from the nursing profession um, via the unions, but that died down very quickly because the issue there was that the nurses were looking for increased numbers of advanced nurse practitioners. And once they got that, there's been nothing from the nursing community. In fact, they love to see a physician associate on the team. I don't know if Aaron or anyone else wants to add to that. Feel free, Aaron. Yeah, uh, so I suppose just following on from what Pauline said there, probably should have mentioned that um, although I, we're a colorectal team, so on the medical team, I, it's me and my consultant. We have a clinical nurse specialist on our team. We have an advanced nurse practitioner also on our team. It has kind of come to the time now where me and the advanced nurse practitioner are doing the rounds together. So you, you have to think about it. The advanced nurse practitioner are trained to a very similar level, but in the nursing model and the medical model, I don't know if you know much about those, but they're two different ways of looking at a patient, so to say. And that's where the benefit has come in of the PA is that I am now the medical model, I'll put that in inverted commas, um, and she looks at the patient as a holistic view of a nursing model. And it's it's worked quite well. We're, we've shortened ward rounds, we're coming up with plans, um, advanced nurse practitioners are able to prescribe, so we're able to brainstorm and think about what to do. In, in terms of your NCHD and, and fellows and things like that, competition is there for the training spots, but in, in terms of competition for theatre time and surgery, you give as a PA, I'm willing to give that to the, the fellows and the specialist registrars and, and more junior registrars. In terms of your junior doctors, your interns, your SHOs, um, personally, I don't have much experience working with them, but I have worked with them a lot in Beaumont as a student, and they see it more as you're able to take some of the workload off them. And a lot of it is they're doing 60 hours a week as an intern because they're just so snowed under with work they could have 30 40 inpatients both medical and surgical and then they go on call so being a pa on the team you can take some of the what i like to call it as the grunt work of writing discharge letters going review putting in cannulas putting in blood taking bloods these are invaluable for an intern to then go to clinic so to say and review these complex patients and as as lisa uh, alluded to earlier with the in the likes of GP, where you see these chronic conditions, you do see a lot of that in the hospital as well. And these these junior doctors, these SHOs are very well trained. And when they get to a point, they want to escalate their skills a lot more. And that's seeing those complex patients, whereas the PA can have a good knowledge of those uh, smaller things that they, they can alleviate on. Um, so I would say, I, 
I mean, I, I probably understand where you're coming from because uh, you can see a lot of things with some junior doctors on Twitter and things like that where there can be a lot of hostility. But it, I would say in terms of, of Ireland and from most of the UK, I think 99% of people are delighted to have a PA on their, on their team and uh, it, it'll take down their workloads significantly. I, I work with a fellow who's UK trained fellow, a UK trained, trained specialist registrar, he's now a fellow in Ireland in rectal cancer. And he said PAs were being introduced as he was an SHO. And he had the same thoughts. He was like, I think PAs could take my job. And he's like, as a fellow now, I severely disregard that. It's the, as a consultant, he said, I will have a PA on my team. And, and it was that simple. And that's, that's a UK trend uh, fellow who's now a consultant in, going to be in the UK. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, that's a, that's yes, no problem. Thank you. Yeah, come on, lady. Great question. And so from a student's perspective, um, you will be on rotations with medical students. Um, and sometimes there might be competition for like, oh, who gets to take the bloods or who gets to do an NG tube? Because we, we have to get checked off on our booklet for, and probably they do as well, and for like clinical skills that you do. So sometimes um, you might compete for bloods, but Every medical student I've ever come across has been like the nicest person ever. And you kind of just take it in turns. Like if you're on a medical, if you're on a surgical rotation with like four other med students and someone gets to scrub in on Monday, then we just swap around and I get to scrub in on Wednesday and then someone else gets to scrub in on Thursday or whatever. Um, and we kind of just, we've always took it in turns. Like if there, there'll always be bloods to do, there will always be cannulas to put in. And so we just take it in turns. And so there will be a little bit of competition, but it's not, um, them trying to get everything done or we're trying to get everything done and like shoot them out of the way. Yeah. Um, you will come across like little bits of competition like that, but it, they're always, the students are always very, very nice and willing to like share what's there. Um, and that's just from a student's perspective. Okay, yep. so no worries. And one thing I would add, and I think Aaron touched upon it. Um, so you may be aware that the NCHDs are threatening a civil action um, they're, you know, they're in violation of the European work um, hours restrictions. And I can say from the United States, uh, the one sort of sort of catalyst for the expansion of the number of PAs and PA programs was when the residency hour restrictions were enforced for doctors in training. And hospitals sort of looked at each other and said, how are we going to augment the workforce if we can only have these residents or these trainees working so many hours a week? And it was those quick thinking hospital administrators who worked with their HR departments and said, we have to double the number of PAs that we have on staff if we're going to be able to take care of patients in a safe and quality manner. So I think that is one of the interesting sort of workforce phenomenons that, you know, those of us or those individuals who aren't in the trenches, so to speak, that don't work um, in hospitals or have a familiarity with the way hospitals work, um, I think it's, um, it's just a human resource factor. You know, you have to have people that can take care of patients. And as Clyde said, there are plenty of patients to go around. <laughs> Pauline? Two questions, Go ahead. if you want to address. Um, first one is the numbers that we plan to take for 2023. Sure. Uh, we would love to have at least 20 to 25 students on campus. And our, our projection for the remote is 10 students. But if we have more, that will be um, one of the things that we have to consider. But we're projecting, we'd love to have an online uh, com a combined student enrollment of somewhere between 30 and 35. Sure. <laughs> the difference between a doctor and a PA.
<laughs> oh, there you go. Okay, sorry. So um, maybe I'll ask you, um, what do you think of differences between a doctor and a PA is? Doctor goes to school a lot longer, right? A doctor has the ultimate responsibility for the, PA, the patient. The PA works alongside and complements the work and the service provided to a, to a patient, but they um, are covered by the same sort of insurance or um, malpractice indemnification that's provided for the doctor. Um, so I think that there's a sort of training and education difference primarily. Uh, I think that PAs um, come to this profession for a variety of different reasons. And many times, and I'm sure Claudia or Aaron or any of our students, many times the doctors will say, why don't you just go to medical school? And I always say, that's a lovely compliment that you would think that I would have this, the same capacity uh, to uh, take on that role. But we all have reasons, you know? And so I think that we all find a profession, a calling, if you will, based upon our intrinsic motivation and drive. And so I chose not to study as a physician. I chose to embark upon what I thought would be a trailblazing, change agent, transformational, you know, sort of occupation or profession. And I think that's one of the things that you see around about PAs. They want to improve the system. They want to bring patient care, the highest quality patient care to patients. They may have had a bad experience with a family member. They may have seen something that they didn't particularly think was fair. And trust me, there are patients all across the country that need care. We just had our first PA hired in the mental health arena, and we all hear about mental health services and how desperate they're needed. And to think that we now have PAs working in that field really warms my heart in some ways because it just shows the diversity and the, um, the multitude of opportunities that can um, be yours if you choose to become a PA. There's a question just about funding for the program. So just to refer to scholarships. And the question is, is it consistent every year with the number we get? And the short answer is no. Um, but we're hoping to increase our scholarships for students coming on the program. We generally approach the private sector for that. And what happens is that if they fund your, fee, your fees for two years, you sign a contract to work with them for two years. It might be a one-year contract, work with them one year. However, people have um, separately gone to industry and looked for scholarship, and they've been successful as well as individuals. So you could try individually. We cannot say straight off that there will be so many scholarships every year. Um, the process is that you must get accepted onto the RCSI program first before you would be even considered for a scholarship. So it's a bit of a catch-22, we do understand, and we understand that fees are an issue for people, but we are getting more hopeful um, about scholarships that we will increase the number. We've approached more people this year. Yes. Can I just add as well about the general, there's like a key difference between medicine that when you do this course, like if you were to do medicine, you're- Gina, do you want to come down? Because online- <laughs> <laughs> they can't hear you online, Gina. Yes. Yeah. Come on, Gina. I love it when students correct me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Fine. Sorry. So I just wanted to add that a key difference as well when you do this course is that you're you're not locked into a particular speciality when you do graduate. So you can actually go into Let's say you you did a rotation in your um oh god leave the camera let's say, <laughs> let's say you had you did a rotation you were like oh I really like cardio and then you get a job there for maybe two years and you decide oh I don't know whether if you were between two let's say and you said you liked gynae or something you can actually change and totally change around your career and go into gynae then so 
unlike medicine where you're locked into you specialize and then that's kind of it you you you'd have to go back to college to do a different speciality I think it's good that if you aren't sure and you're someone who you just know that you do like patient care and the actual job you're not restricted to having to pick which which exact rotation you like and which one you have to go into so that was something I definitely thought was like an added bonus that you're not locked into something for for the rest of your life so yeah. okay yeah we have a question from the audience And I'm really interested in the anesthetic side of the development of the system. So, typically, in terms of the trade across the surgery, like that. Has there been any way to program who has gone down the anesthetic route? Or is there any kind of, I suppose, constraints with regards to regulation? Personally, I'm very confident to say, look, these crystals haven't been here so many times, but is there any kind of constraints around that? Well, not not at the present. In fact, I think just, we just repeat the question. Oh, sure, sure, sure. MS there, as well. yeah. Huh? Uh, MS yeah, I know. Yeah. But I think um, <laughs> I think the um, question was: Are there any sort of PA roles currently in anesthesia, critical care? Um, what else? Okay, um, and currently we have one graduate working in anesthesia. And a second post we think is going to be created in the, in the near future. Uh, I will tell you that I've spoken to the director of the critical care unit at Beaumont, and Aaron actually did a placement in the critical care unit because in the United States, at least, I have been somewhat amazed at the uptake of um, critical care positions for physician associates. And um, again, it has to do with that sort of rotation and the continuity of care. And I think that in high critical areas like the ICU, um, you happen to have a lot of people rotating in and out all the time. Mm -hmm. Right. So there's really no restriction on um, the whatever field the PA branches out into, as long as they have a consultant that would work in collaboration with them. An esthetist? position offered through like one after five about a month ago. Yeah, she, I think she took it. Yeah. Yeah. Take <laughs> In terms, of your ICU, sorry, in terms of your ICU question and critical care, um, as Lisa said, I was lucky enough to do a rotation with one of the professors in critical care and ICU, and his aspirations for the role is to have that one person in there that's constantly there, whether they want to do ICU for five years or two years, but you'll be there for two years. These are ICU registers are generally anesthesia registrars and specialist registrars, so they change every so often between anesthetists and theatre and then in ICU. You also get respiratory medicine uh, SPRs coming down to ICU as well. So his ambition for the role was that because you'll be there for so long, we get you proficient in doing procedures. And by my, in, when I mean procedures, I mean like putting in art lines, putting in central lines, very invasive procedures in time. He, he's not saying that I'm going to put you into that within a month. It's I'll put you into it within a year. And his ambition for is to even grow it even further um, in, in the hospital that I went to. So in terms of your question, there, there will be definitely uh, positions coming up in the ICU. And in terms of, I know you mentioned cardiothoracic surgery there. I do know, pretty sure Clyde, one of Clyde's classmates was in cardiothoracic St. James's. In, in the three, three, oh great, even better. <laughs> three students have gone through IC, uh, cardiothoracic and I'm, I'm pretty sure I would imagine a job coming up there in, in the very near future. Um, it's just a matter of, the, the biggest thing with these hospitals is like St. James's and stuff, there hasn't been a PA in there just yet and it's getting one in the door um it was the same in vincent's where i work one of my colleagues in bariatric surgery she works there there's now three of us there within a year um it's it's just getting one person in the door and then they're like okay i really need this and then it just blows up so in terms of your question yes there will be positions and if if your consultant is interested in you doing it you can certainly approach him um 
and as the guy said, like scholarships, there has been people in the past that have done the same, have worked with people very closely and they've funded them and committed to working with them. Yeah, exactly. Great. Yeah. And, and I think you, if, if your consultant has any questions, I would, I would definitely get them in contact with Lisa and Pauline. And uh, I mean, they can contact us as, a, as graduates as well um, to come and have a chat. And I'm sure your consultant will, I'm pretty sure, know the consultant that the guys are in contact with. So right. they can always be put in contact, you know. Yeah. And interestingly, we had a we had a meeting this morning with um, two two consultants, um, one of which was looking for to develop the role of a PA in robotics. Now we have Orla, who was in the video. She works in robotics. She does robotic surgery with her team. I believe this role they had in mind was robotics in urology. Um, or, and then the other one was, oh, transplants. So that's another huge role for PAs that's, I think, going to emerge in the near future. So the retrieval, the, you know, the, the whole spectrum of services. HSC salary scale. So we're working right now with the HSC. Um, been a challenge, let's put it that way, um, but we're, we don't give up. And I am telling you that if they, they don't get a, they get weekly emails from me, let's put it that way. Um, and what I'm advocating for is a benchmarking study that would be able to um, look at the role and then find a comparable role within the health sector and then have an equivalent salary. Um, because our students are trained at the master's level and we just did a census or, um, and that is our first ever graduate survey. We collected a ton of data on what PAs do each and every day and how many, day, how many hours they work a week, you know, the types of patients that they see, the duties that, they can, that they're responsible for. And we hope that this data will be a very compelling um, sort of argument to help the HSC with this benchmarking survey or benchmarking exercise. But right now they're pegged at the, I wanna say SHO level three. Yeah, that's what it started. Yeah, it's so it's sort of in the late, the high forties in that um, ballpark, but we, we're gonna advocate for a much higher starting salary. But um, you know, it's really hard because you're trying to sell a profession that is uh, cost neutral, if you will. But if anyone knows about, you know, the HSC, they spend so much money on locums every year uh, and the exorbitant costs associated with that kind of employee that I say, you know, just give us the money and we'll, <laughs> we'll take care of your PA budget. So, um, so right now that's where, that's where we stand. In the privates, they have a different, they have a different uh, sort of approach to HR. And I think we're gonna get into the situation where there's gonna be a competition, you know, that the, the privates will drive much of the salary discussion because they want these individuals working for them. So the HSC is gonna have to compete. That's it. Okay. Well, I think that's going to wrap it up, but we will stay here in the theater if there are people in, um, um, that are, you know, are present. If they want to talk to us, we have all of our students or some of the students here. And uh, thank you again for your interest in the program. May I remind you that the deadline for applications is the end of July. So if you have any desire to be part of this group that starts in January, please make a note of that date. And it, that is the date when everything must be received. So we know that it, time, it takes time to get transcripts, it takes time to get references. So please factor that into your planning if you are interested in joining the class. I think we require two. Yeah, two letters of reference, yeah. Okay, thanks again, take care.